Okay, let's all stand together, please. Feel the ground underneath your feet. Take a deep breath and bring your awareness to God's presence. Acknowledge His presence in your heart, in your mind. Our Father in heaven, you are here with us right now. You care about us. You've come to get us, to rescue and redeem us. How can we not respond by caring about you, by loving you and worshiping you? We bring to mind, Father, all of our sin and how you have completely redeemed us and rescued us. We glory in your promise that there is nothing that holds us away from you, that there's no separation, that you live within us. We are your temple. That there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. Would you please, Spirit, remind us of your precious promises today? Would you minister to us as we come to give you honor and glory? We love you, Lord. I can't describe 
describe it's way too high you see me through and through and you call me love what a wonderful grace you form me in oh you form me in my mother's womb you know my flesh my flesh and bone oh yeah i'm wonderfully made and i can't describe it's way too high you see me through and through and you call me love what a wonderful grace oh i can't run no i can't hide even darkness is a light from the lowest place to the highest praise you are worthy amazing love how can it be it's far too wonderful for me there's only one thing left to sing you are worthy you guys can be seated Your love is, your love is, your love is strong. Your love is, your love is, your love is so strong. Your love is, your love is, your love is so strong. Your love is, your love is, your love is so strong. Your love is, your love is, your love is so strong. Your love is, your love is, your love is so strong. Your love is,
that your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us weary sinners and lead us far away from our vices and deliver us from these prisons. Your love is, your love is, your love is strong. Your God in heaven. Oh God in heaven, hallowed be thy name above all names. Let your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us today our daily bread. Forgive us, weary sinners, and lead us far away from our vices and deliver us from these prisons. Your I give you back this life I owe that in your ocean depths its flow may richer fuller be O light O light that follows all my way I yield my flickering torch to thee and my heart restores its borrowed ray that in your sunshine's blaze its day may brighter, fairer be. Rejoice, my heart, rejoice, my soul. My Savior God has come to thee. Rejoice, my heart, because you've been made whole by love. joy, oh joy that seeks me through the pain. I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain. Then morn shall tearless be. So rejoice, so rejoice my heart. Rejoice, my soul, my Savior God has come to thee. Rejoice, my heart, you've been made whole by love that will not let me go. It's a love that will not let me go. that lifts and holds my head I dare not ask to fly from thee 
Well, I lay in dust life's glory day That from the ground there blossoms red The life that shall endless be Rejoice my heart, rejoice my soul My Savior God has come to thee I will rejoice my heart as you've been made whole by love that will not let me go. Oh, love that will not let me go. It's a love that will not let me go. I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I always do But every song must end But you never so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah And I know it's not much, I've nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah I'll stand together and sing. I've got one response. I've got one response. I've got just one move. With my arms stretched wide, I will worship you. I throw them up. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. All that I have is a heart. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. In your mind's eye, imagine being before a throne, the most glorious throne you've ever, you ever could imagine. You're before the Ancient of Days, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And all the wrongs in life have somehow been made right. All the grief you're feeling right now, imagine a time where that is just a memory. That he has gotten rid of all evil. There is peace. And there's all these creatures around the throne. Imagine it in your own eye, in your own mind, is singing holy, holy, holy. There's all these saints, these godly people throwing down these crowns, bowing down 
singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And you realize that it's all about Him. And it's always been about Him. Everything we ever did here in this lifetime, it's all gifts to His glory. All to and through and for Him. And the things that we've done that are not uh, for that are burned away. They don't, they don't make it into eternity. But the life we live for Him is before Him as these crowns, as these jewels, as these gifts before a king. day will come. So come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul, because you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, so come on, my soul, oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord One more time Oh, come on my soul Don't you get shy on me Lift up your song You've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Cause all that we have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And we know it's not much. We've nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. We've got those lions inside of our lungs. We get up and praise the Lord. You are worthy of it all, of every ounce of our strength and our attention, our imaginations, our skills, our, our talents, everything, every breath is all to you and for you, by you, for your glory, sustained by you. So we surrender to you and the happy freedom of knowing we live in a universe that is just not about us. Lord, we just let that pressure fall off of our shoulders, the pressure to perform and make our own dynasties and legacies, to make names for ourselves and to value ourselves by the mark we make on this planet. Lord, the pressure is astounding. Gosh. On Sundays, I pray all around the city, all around our nation, all around this world that your people would be at peace knowing that it's not about us it's about you we can relax we can be free we can breathe easy so we surrender all the stuff that we're anxious about all the stuff that we think is up to us we just dare to let it go and trust you thank you we love you, Lord. We remember you today. In Jesus' name, amen.
Okay, welcome to Calvary Wallingford. Uh, so glad to have you guys here on this Memorial Day weekend. Um, and with a heater that's working, I keep forgetting to announce that. You know, before you may not s smell the fuel um, and be intermittently cold and then hot. It's because they, we did, f they did fix the heater in here. Is it too warm? No, 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 no. <laughs> that was quick. No, no, we like it. Just look around and when you see people doing the, huh? During the sermon, then that's when it's time to click on the AC. I'll give you the signal. Um, we have a few announcements to get started. Um, we've got some summer events coming up. We're partnering with the Union Gospel Mission throughout the summer. Um, the first thing on the docket that we would love for you to participate in. This is a really simple but powerful event. Um, June 26th at 6 p.m. at University Presbyterian Church, just not too far from here. They have a graduation where, where men that have come into their program, gotten off the street, have gone through their, uh, their process and are now graduating uh, from Union Gospel Mission. And they invite the community to come out, especially the church community, to come out and celebrate God's faithfulness in their lives. Um, let me just put it this way. Do you believe that God still does miracles? If, if Yes, if you want to see it. If you actually want to see it and not just say that you believe it, if you want to go and see it, go to this thing, and you'll see men that have been raised from the dead that have, it's just as miraculous as an arm growing back or something. It's amazing that God has gripped these men, saved them from absolute hopelessness and despair, and taken them through this program, and, and they, are being, they are healed and being healed and one thing that they need from us is for us to affirm that in their lives, to say, you have been gripped by the Spirit of God. And just by showing up and applauding them when they graduate from this program is such a boon to their morale and to their hearts. So please, we're all going to go out to that. My family and I will be there. That's June 26th, uh, not too far from here, 6 p.m., and it's simple. If you go, the ministry of taking up space, the ministry of showing up is so big here. Go and, and cheer them on. And what did you just say? I just can't hear you. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yep. Wheelchair accessible. It's all good. Um, also, uh, we have a summer search and rescue. This is for about five or ten people. This is uh, an intense thing. Kids shouldn't come to this. Probably 16 and up, I think, is what they say on their website. Um, we go down to the Union Gospel Mission. They do a training. Um, we hop in their vans, and we go out from 7 uh, to 11 at night. I've done this, and it's just uh, Nathan's done this. Other people have done this. It's just a life-changing event for you to go out there with the Union Gospel Mission staff. They drive you to different homeless camps and they just love on the folks that are there. They give blankets, hot chocolate, sandwiches, uh, socks. And more than that, it's beyond, you, you have to go to see it, but it's, it's beyond handing stuff out. The Union Gospel Mission, they know the, the names of all these folks. They know their lives. They, you know, you'll hear them say, hey, Steve, how's, how's it been going? How's, did you ever hear back from your daughter? I mean, they know all the people and the things that are going on there. That is what this is. It is creating relationships with people. I know several of you where this is right up your alley. Uh, I can think of a handful of people where this, you would love this. So join uh, uh, in on this. We'll have a sign, up, uh, a sign up for this coming soon. But we've reserved 10 spots. Uh, it's two vans, five, five people each. We've reserved 10 spots. And by next week, we'll have all of our sign-up sheets rolling out for this. So you can sign up and we can count you in and we can all uh, caravan down there together. But this is something you want to do. Also, uh, in August, we'll be serving a meal at um, Hope Place down at Othello um, from 1145 to 1 p.m. We come and we bring a lunch. This is a, a, a home specifically for women and their children, um, specifically women that they've rescued out of really horrible situations. We get to go provide lunch for them and sit with these gals, learn their names, get to know them, uh, listen to them. Again, several of you, I can just... I can just see that this would be, you, you would love this. So that's August 31st. This is about five people that we need for that. So um, that's going to fill up very quick. Um, men and women can do that, I believe. So, because um, I've 
been there and done that, and it, it was just a great time. Um, and then we've got a book club coming up. Um, Nicole's been trying to do something with the ladies every season. Um, you know, the, you guys just did your spring tulip flower situation, wherever that was. Where was that at again? <laughs> it, was not, it was not where the tulips normally are. Sumner, yes. And it was awesome. I think, it, I personally thought, because we went out to pick them up, I thought it was better than um, wherever the other place we go. What's the typical place? Oh, LeConnor. Gosh, it's going to be a long morning, you guys. I can barely even think. Um, this, this was just phenomenal. But anyway, she, she's doing that. And then in the summertime, um, she, a couple years ago, she, took, she kind of led a, a book group through um, C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy. And by popular request, they want to finish that third book this summer. So there's going to be a women's book club and picnic on July 27th, 1 p.m. down at Green Lake. Get yourself a copy of the book, That Hideous Strength by C.S. Lewis, and read it until then. And then we're, uh, we, meaning you, will get together and have a picnic at Green Lake and talk about the book and see what you like about it and all those types of things. Um, do you have anything else? Okay, yeah, the all-church camp out. You guys, this is so fun. We're going to go and just have fun. That's the whole point. Um, we're going east of the mountains to Easton, the Double K Ranch. Um, it's 125 bucks per person. If you can't uh, afford that, we are willing to help out if you need some help with that. But we want to get all of you out there as, uh, as much as possible. Um, it's, there's places for your tents. If you're not a tenting person, if you're more of a glamper, there's also places for you to sleep inside. It is wheelchair accessible, Renee, so you can come out there. In fact, we're expecting you to be out there roasting your marshmallows around that fire. There is a big bonfire. That's where we're going to be hanging out at night. But there's, uh, we're going to have um, like panning for gold for kids. We're also going to take our kids fishing where there's this pond where they're guaranteed to catch a fish. Um, it, it's going to be, there's hikes, there's a shooting range if you want to go and shoot. There's all sorts of fun things. There's human foosball that we're going to do. Or you can sleep, you can read a book, you can, whatever you want to do. But we're going to do it together, come together at night. Um, we will be canceling church here on that Sunday and having our church service up there. So please... Make sure you're signed up for that. Again, all of our sign-up sheets will be electronically available next Sunday and will be linked to the app. And so really easy for you to sign up for that. But we want to get moving on that um, right away. So fun stuff going on there. Okay? Is there anything else? That was it? Fantastic. A lot of stuff coming up for the summertime. Um, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, please. Oh, by the way... If you guys had not noticed, Hal is in the house. Woo! Hal, yeah. <laughs> Hal has been gone. <laughs> I made you laugh. I'm glad about that. Hal has been gone for four months. Yeah? Four months at, in a rehab facility uh, down in Kent. And been trying to get back. He's back in his house now and back, back to gathering with us. What a beautiful thing. Hal, love to see you. Please, if you don't know Hal, go meet him. He's just a wonderful, wonderful brother in the Lord. And it's so good to have you back, man. Thank you for coming. Um, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. We're just going to, there's plenty in this one line, this famous line of Jesus. Let me read it here. So whatever you wish that others would do to you. Go and do that for them, for this is the law and the prophets. Father, um, would, you, would you blossom this famous line from your son? Would you uh, help us to explore um, this one sentence that is so packed with your heart and with truth? Would you unlock it in our own minds and our hearts and show us how it appropriates to our own lives and our relationships especially? Jesus, we're here at your feet just like disciples have been for thousands of years contemplating these words, your words. Here we are in this great tradition listening to you, asking a living God, a living rabbi who you're here now in your spirit would you please expound this to us 
again. Thank you for your goodness. And we acknowledge you here. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this is by far one of the most well-known statements of Jesus. Uh, you don't have to be religious to know this line from Jesus and uh, that it came from Jesus. We've dubbed it the golden rule. And here it is again. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And this um, saying, this one line in the mind of most Westerners has landed Jesus in the company of the great spiritual and moral people in history. You know, people like Confucius, Gandhi, uh, Gautama Buddha, um, and more, and many, many more. And this saying is not controversial. Um, no, I mean, who has a problem with the golden rule? <laughs> Who's got issue? Who's going sit, to sit here and say the golden rule actually is horrible? No, everybody understands that this is an incredible. In fact, some have dubbed this, some secular folks have dubbed this the Mount Everest of all ethical tradition. And I think they're right. This is way, light years, millennia ahead of its time when it comes to social ethics and how we should treat one another. So what is it? And what are its implications? Um, today, we're going to spend all of our time playing around with this famous one-liner, trying to wrap our minds around its depth, its breadth, and its width. And we're going to attempt to think through it by, sticking, by working through an outline. We're going to ask uh, or go through three main points. How important is the golden rule within Jesus' paradigm of reality? We're first going to explore that. Um, is this like a bumper sticker thing? Is this like a, a fortune cookie situation? Or, no, or how, how does this fit um, within what he's been saying so far? I think we'll really discover the answer to this by seeing how it functions within the entire Sermon on the Mount. Secondly, we're going to take it apart line by line and then put it back together again using our own words. And I think that'll be really helpful for us. And then finally... From there, we're going to be able to adequately explore its implications in our lives and for our world. That's what we're going to do this morning. So first of all, let's weigh out the value of this statement by exploring how it fits and functions within the Sermon on the Mount as a whole. And the, the first word in the sentence gives us a real clue. The first word is the word so. Um, in the Greek, it's the word own. Um, which is also the same word that's translated as therefore. And therefore, or so or therefore, is a word that does not point forward necessarily, but therefore points back at what has already been said. In fact, um, the words like so and therefore are summary words, if you want. Um, basically saying, I'm going to sum up what has already been spoken up to this point. They point back. So on one level, the golden rule sums up what has already been said in the entire Sermon on the Mount. It's all distilled and boiled down to this. Or you could put it this way, the golden rule is the essence or the distilled kernel of the entire Sermon on the Mount. It sums up the entire heart behind what we have been studying and learning and listening to so far. Everything that we've been going through in great detail can all be boiled down to, to this. In other words, the kind of people that Jesus is making his followers into. So, not angry people, you know, perpetuating hatred, but rather peacemaking people, right? Not lustful people, exploiting others to satiate our own desires. No, but, but people, people that value other people and give to other people. You know, all of his teachings on generosity, not returning, e not returning evil for evil, even loving our enemies, all of that with motives to worship God before an audience of one, all of that is summed up in this one line, do to others what you would have them do to you. But it doesn't only sum up his sermon. There are actually layers to this. Jesus is doing a few different things here. He is summing up his sermon, but Jesus is actually distilling something much bigger into one sentence. Look what he says in verse 12 toward the end. He says, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. <clears throat> For this sums up, some of your translations say, the law and the prophets. 
For those of you who are new to the Bible, the phrase the law and the prophets was Jewish shorthand signaling the entire, what we would call the entire Old Testament. The entire Bible, that was the, that was the Bible they had in Jesus' day. He would say the entire Bible is summed up, is distilled into this sentence. This is the essence of it. So here are some other ways that you could translate this. For this, the golden rule, is the law and the prophets. That's another way to sum it up. Or, the golden rule is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Or, the golden rule is what the entire Old Testament is all about. That's another way. Or, how about this one? Add up God's law and the prophets and the golden rule is what you get. That's what Jesus is saying. So Jesus is saying that in one sentence, he is distilled. Now think of the immensity of this claim. In one sentence, he has distilled the entire Old Testament. That's 613 laws. 613 laws, not to mention the characters of the Bible, the storylines, the narrative, the poetry, the apocalyptic language, all the, the legal language, all of it is distilled down to its purest essence in this one line. Now notice the nuance here. Jesus is distilling, not reducing the law and the prophets. He's not, for example, saying, in the Old Testament, you can forget about all the rest. It just, just remember this one part. That's not what he's saying. No, rather, Jesus is saying that everything in the Old Testament, all of it is important, and it's all in service to this main heart or theme, do to others what you would want them to be done to you. He is not getting rid of any of it but distilling it to its purest form. He's condensing it and squeezing it down to its purest, purest form. Jesus is holding a certain kind of tension here in the golden rule. Although he's distilling the Old Testament, make no mistake about it, Jesus is a biblicist through and through. Jesus is an ancient conservative rabbi who has a high, off-the-charts view of the Bible. You need to understand that. And I have to say this in our culture because I run into a lot of people in Seattle that say, you know, I, I love everything that Jesus says. I just, I could care less about the Old Testament. Um, you know, I, I, there's an old, there's, this is actually not new. There's an old early church uh, heresy called Marcionism, which basically said the God of the Old Testament is this tyrant uh, kind of created God, the God of the New Testament, the God of Jesus is the, real, is the real God. And we hear that today. The Old Testament I can't understand, but I love Jesus. And usually the assumption is that Jesus came to change everything, that he came to keep, that he came to keep what's important and throw out the rest, that he trimmed the fat off the law and the prophets. No. I'm sorry, no. Uh, go back to chapter 5, verse 17, and you will hear Jesus himself say, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Another way to translate that is not to abolish the many laws, but to comprehend and see them in their innermost essence. That's what he's saying. To Jesus... He is talking, he is, he is uh, taking all this immense power and wisdom and the beautiful complexity of the Old Testament and he's compressing that vision and depth and mystery into one accurate, potent pill of a sentence. That's what he's doing. It's, it's incredible what he's doing. Also, it's worth pointing out that verse 5 uh, or chapter 5, verse 17, is the first time in the Sermon on the Mount that the phrase, the law and the prophets, is mentioned. And chapter 7, verse 12, the golden rule, is the last time in the Sermon on the Mount the law and the prophets is mentioned, meaning that these are the bookends of the Sermon on the Mount. In other words, you, could, you, could, uh, you can say it like this. Um, the Beatitudes, that's chapter 5, 1 through 10. You could call that the prologue of the sermon or the intro to the sermon. Then you've got this beautiful calling and invitation to be that I'm going to make you into the light of the world. I'm going to make you into, into the salt of the earth. This beautiful identity statement. Followed by this thesis statement 
in chapter 5, 17 through 20, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes or gets rid of or backs off of one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, they're going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them, we're going to get into that word in the next couple of weeks, poieo, practices them. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness, dikaiosune, unless your wholeness, your completeness within yourself and with your relationships exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's the thesis of the entire sermon. And then that's followed by 14 teachings. That's what we've been doing up to this point. 14 teachings kind of fleshing this thesis out. I'm not, you're not going to be angry. You're going to be peacemaking. You're not going to be lustful. You're going to be loving. You're not going to be this. You're going to be that. All of what we've been going through, generosity and fasting and secret place and prayer, it's all in service to this fulfilling of what God has always wanted. And then we come to where we're at today, 7 verse 12, where we see an even shorter teaching on the law and the prophets, signaling the end of the sermon, and then chapter 7 verses 13 through 27 function as the epilogue or the outro. That's how the sermon is framed. In the next two weeks, and two weeks after this, we will finish the Sermon on the Mount. In short, the Sermon on the Mount is a distilled summary of the entire Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, what, what we call the Old Testament. And the Golden Rule is the distilled summary of the Sermon on the Mount, which is a distilled sur- summary of the Law and the Prophets. It's like we've got inception here going on. So the Golden Rule is not some pithy bumper sticker saying to Jesus. It's not like a, a kind of throwaway one-liner Not at all, you know, powerful but easily forgotten. No, no, no. To Jesus, this is packed and freighted with the entire heart of God as portrayed in the Old Testament. He's packed it all into this one line. In other words, this this is what it's all about. This is what the social law of the law and the prophets is all about. It's all here, okay? So, let's look at it. It all comes down to this. Let's zoom in and analyze the, some key words in the sentence and let's see what happens. Let's start out with the phrase, so whatever. So whatever. This is the Greek word, pas. And it's a big word. To, it, it encapsulates, in other words, everything. It's a big hyperbolic word. This means you could translate this, in, so in every, in every situation or in all seasons, or at all times, or from morning until night, okay? Or in all that you say and do, with all of your heart and with all of your energy and with all of your life, everything. That's what he's saying here. Number two, let's, uh, let's skip the wish part and come, and come back to it. We'll still with others. Whatever you wish others. Um, the word others here is the word anthropoi. It means, it's a word that's translated to mean all people, okay? Um, He could have used another word. He could have used the word Adelphoi, which means just brothers and sisters or people within your own tribe. But instead, he uses the word others, another very, very, very big word. In other words, so not just your family, but your neighbors, your coworkers, your acquaintances, Not just your friends and the people you get along with, but your enemies, the people that you don't see eye to eye with. Not just nationals, but foreigners. Not just the same color of skin, but different color of skin. Not just the same gender, but different genders. Not just the people you agree with or are on the same aisle of of politics with, but everybody, everybody, do to them what you would want to be done to you. Okay, and then he says, whatever you wish. Notice how open-ended that is. Whatever you want. Whatever you want. He doesn't get specific. He leaves it open according to you. There's a level of freedom here. In other words, get creative. This is what he's saying. Get creative. Imagine whatever you would want for yourself in all situations and circumstances, do that. 
That's what you should do for someone else in the same situation or circumstances. Notice what Jesus, he starts, notice that Jesus, this is interesting to me, he starts with you. He starts with you. The place to treat other people starts with yourself. Um, Listen to what Martin Luther said. He said, it was certainly clever for Christ to state it this way. The only example... Uh, The only example he sets up is ourselves. The book is laid into your own bosom, so to speak, and it is so clear that you do not need glasses to understand Moses and the law. Thus, you are your own Bible, Martin Luther says, your own teacher, your own theologian, your own preacher. In other words, you can understand the essence of the Bible because you are human. And the Bible is the character of God, and you were made in the image of God. There is a certain tenor or pitchfork that pings with the Old Testament. It's uniquely human in the idealistic sense. Treat others. In other words, you can start, in a sense, with yourself. In Jesus' day, people were often advising um, people to consult with sages, scribes, rabbis, gurus, but as essential as all those people are and always will be. He's not saying not to do that. But Jesus says, in effect, in personal relationships, start by consulting with yourself. How would you want to be treated? What do you need? What kind of love do you want? That's probably common to every human to a certain level. It's a great way to ping it and to start with yourself. Most of the time, when it comes to relationships, you can know the will of God by consulting your own interests. Isn't that interesting? John Henry Newman, I think I've said this before, the great Catholic scholar and theologian, once said that our conscience, our conscience is the aboriginal vicar of Christ to the soul. Our conscience is the aboriginal vicar of Christ to the soul. In other words, there is a image of God in you that, yes, has been tainted by sin, but is still alive and well, that, uh, that understands and listens to and perks up or, um, or recognizes the, the heart of God, the character of God. There's something in all humans, uh, a collective consciousness, where we know what goodwill is. We know what fair and just is and righteousness is. We know about goodwill. We know about, you know, again, it, we might see it tainted and warped and twisted and infected by sin, but there is some pure truth behind it. The Bible's um, theology of evil is that evil cannot make something um, ex nihilo the way, God, the way God can. Evil is a parasite off the good. So that means With all the evil we see in ourselves and out there, there's something pure about it that's just been twisted, warped, manipulated, defiled. But there's something good underneath of it all. That's why a scholar uh, and deceased beloved pastor Tim Keller, he said that he has a he has a um, an equation that he uses when looking at the culture. It's very simple, but it's so profound. When he deals with culture and himself, he always says, "I say yes." But no, but yes. In other words, if he sees something evil, he goes, what's in there that I can bless first? What is the godly character behind it or the good, the true, and the beautiful in it that I can identify and bless first? So I can say, yes, you do need beauty. Or yes, you do need to be relieved from your pain. Or yes, you do need to be recognized and affirmed. And and you do need affection. And yes, you do need other people. So yes but not the way you're doing it, but no. And then he points to Jesus, but yes, the fulfillment is in him, but yes. We can do that with ourselves. And our conscience, John Henry Newman says, reminds us of that sometimes. How do you know? Well, it's usually the still small voice that's telling you to do something that you normally would not want to do, that gives you no benefit to yourself. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about? That, that wrestling match where you know you should be doing something and it won't benefit you, you won't get any accolades for it, it will not advance you in any way, it's just the right thing to do. That's usually that aboriginal vicar of Christ to the soul. Well, it's powerful. Um, there's this, listen to this person's account of this. One night, a number of years ago, When David was just an infant, 
I was awakened by his wailing cries. He was probably four months old or so at the time. I remember glancing at the clock, and it was around one in the morning. In a flash of a moment, one in the morning, I had this impression or this sense or this feeling, a thought of something that I should do, and this was it. Get up and tend to David so that Nancy, my wife, can, can sleep. He goes on, if you think about it, this sort of sense is very basic. We're all people. And when we're seeing others as people, we have a very basic sense about others. Namely, that like ourselves, they have hopes, needs, cares, and fears. But, listen to what he says, I didn't act on it. I just stayed in bed listening to David wail and cry. You might say, I betrayed myself. I betrayed my sense of what I, was, what I should do for Nancy. I just mean that in acting contrary to my sense of what was appropriate, I betrayed my own sense of how I should be towards another person. He calls this um, self-betrayal. And in a sense, Jesus is saying, saying, stop, slow down, listen to yourself. Listen to that still small voice by imagining what you would do and what you would want if you were in that person's skin, situation, or circumstances, and then go do that for them. This is marriage 101. <laughs> if you want smoother sailing, I will not say smooth, but if you want smoother sailing, start there. This is relationships 101. Stop. First of all, don't react. Stop. Stop. Pause, think about, if I was in that person's shoes, how would I want to be treated? If I was my child, who's also a human being, how does he want to be treated? Even at nine, how does he need to be treated? And how can I guide him and parent him like that? You can see how far-reaching this is going. I can feel us getting uncomfortable. Or is that just me? It might just be me. Scott McKnight, one of my favorite commentators on the book of Matthew, he says, if you listen to yourself in all of life, you will be led out of yourself into a life of loving others. This is his response to people that say, well, it's selfish to think of yourself. And he would say, yeah, if you stop there. Yes, if you stop there. But if you transfer what's going on in yourself to the other, it becomes you're led to loving others. Let me read that again. If you listen to yourself in all of life, you will be led out of yourself into a life of loving others. Again, don't stop with yourself, but keep moving. Finally, the last phrase is do also to them. We've kind of already covered this. In other words, whatever you want for yourself, go do that for other people. Go do it. So here's what we've we got so far. Let, let's put it together. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example of how I put it together in my own words. With all of your life, here's the golden rule. With all of your life, in all situations, at all times, and in all places, from morning till night, with every fiber of your being, with the same creative energy and passion and alacrity with which you meet your own needs and wants, go do that for anyone and everyone you will ever meet or ever come in contact with. Do that as your rule of life. How are we doing? Good. Yes. Okay. With all of your life, in all situations, at all times, and in all places, from morning till night, with every fiber of your being, with the same creative energy and passion and alacrity with which you meet your own needs and wants, go do that for anyone and everyone. Jesus would say, this is what it's all, this is what it's all about. Or... God's heart, as written in the ancient scriptures, all comes down to this. Or this is what it's all about. This is what God always had in mind for humanity. This is what it means to be human. This is God's high view of humanity. This is what we were meant to shoot towards. Or this kind of living is what you were made for. Keep following me and I'll show you how. That's what Jesus is saying. This is the kind of relational humanity that you were made for, keep following me and I'll show you how to do it. I'm going to grow, you, grow this into you. Okay, so what are, the, what are the implications? Well, first of all, I can tell you this is groundbreaking. Like I've already said, this is millennia ahead of its time. As far as we can tell, no one ever said 
this except for Jesus. This is the first time this saying blips up on the, on the historical map, okay? In primeval history, the social law that finally kind of brought humanity into order a little bit was um, lex talionis, or an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. In other words, what anyone does to you, do it back to them. If they, if they gouge out an eye, gouge out their eye. If they lose one of your things, then you deserve to have, have their things. And it can go the other way too, you know? Hey, I like your shirt, I like your shoes, or, you know, or whatever. You know, it's just kind of this back and forth fairness. And that was good to a certain level. The problem is we try to one-up each other on the bad side, you know. You slap me in the face, I punch out your teeth. You know, that's kind of how our human nature goes around it. Then around the 5th and 4th century before Christ, Confucius showed up on the scene, and he famously said, whatever you would not want to be done to you, don't do that to other people. Whatever you would not want to be done for you, don't do that. About 500 years later, a famous rabbi named Hillel basically said the same thing. Um, this man came into town, a, a pilgrim. He was, um, try, he was exploring Judaism, and he came to this famous rabbi named Hillel, and he said, look, if you can tell me, if you can distill the entire law and the prophets down to one sentence while I'm standing on one leg, I will convert and become a Jew and worship Yahweh. And Hillel famously said, whatever you would not want done to you, don't do, do, do that to others. Go and learn this. This is the law and the prophets. Everything else is commentary. Okay? Now this is basically the negative version of Jesus' golden rule. And a lot of people would say, well, actually, the golden rule is not new. I mean, those things are so similar. So one is negative and one is positive. So what? But as similar as the two sayings may sound, when you start thinking about them in detail, you'll notice a massive difference, actually. For example, there's a big difference between not doing something to cause pain and suffering to someone versus doing something to bless them and alleviate suffering. There's a massive gap of a difference there. Um, I'm all for not hurting people, but that's not the same as intentionally going out of my way to love my enemies. See how different that is? And in that way, this is a giant leap forward that I will argue we still have not realized. I, what I think is in the West, in the Seattle area, we are Confucian. We are Confucianism at best. Love means tolerate, accept, don't bother other people. Just leave them alone. Respect their space. That's what love means. It's basically Confucianism. Don't do to them what you would not want done to you. Leave them alone and tolerate them. And as great as that is, that's def there's definitely some value in that. That is not what Jesus is saying here. That's not what he's saying love is. This is paired, obviously, with what scholars call the Jesus Creed in chapter 22 of Matthew verses. 34 through 40. I wrote it down without the address. Let me just read it to you. Someone came to him and said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? In other words, what does the Old Testament come, come down to? That's what he's asking him. Jesus' response. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. So this is like the vertical piece of the Old Testament between us and God. Love him, Right? But he goes on, he adds another. He says, and I'll do you one better. The second is like it, or, or you could translate it, flows from it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands depends all the law and the prophets, or hangs all the law and the prophets. Jesus is saying that your relationship with God is absolutely tethered to your relationship with other people. It is not, and I've heard this taught before, it is not work on your love for God, and now that you've got that down, maybe work on loving other people. No, you, you do the two, two simultaneously. As if, if you love God with all your heart, your mind, and soul, and strength, you are going to begin and continue growing in your love for other, anthropoi, for everyone. Not just people in your tribe, but everyone the two go hand in hand. You cannot, John would say it very plainly, I think we read this last week, you cannot say you love God and yet hate another person. It's not, it's, that's a, it's non sequitur. That doesn't work. To the degree that you love God, to that degree, you will start turning towards others. 
to the degree that you understand that God has given you mercy, you will be merciful to other people. Now, in our society, love has just become, well, what I will not do. But, um, but to the Bible and certainly to Jesus, what is love? Love is to will the good of the other. We think of it as an emotion here in, in Seattle and in, in our Disney culture. We think of it as an emotion or what feels good. In the Bible, love is to will. That's volitional. I'm going to will the good of someone else regardless of if it benefits me. In fact, even at great risk to myself. I'm going to, I'm going to will the good of someone else at great risk to myself. Now you see, it's not Jesus' version of love is not leave people well alone. It is initiate. It is imagine what you would want and then go do that. Initiate this. Start this. Let me tell you this. I really believe recently that we are on the cusp in our nation of some sort of some kind of a spiritual revival. I do. I, I think that people are more and more curious and they're more and more understanding that the secular humanist worldview is just not giving them the answers that they crave. You know, the human cravings of who am I? What, what's the purpose and meaning of life? Why are we here? The big questions. Secular humanism is just not doing it. The myth of progressivism is just not doing it. In fact, it's making us more anxious. It's making us more suicidal, more depressed. It's putting all this pressure on us to build our own tower to the sky. That's so much pressure. And more and more people are starting to convert and to turn to Christianity. Here's what I want to ask. Are we ready for this? Are we at our church, are we in the evangelical world, are we ready to give lifelong, thousands of years thought through eternal kinds of revelatory answers to people who are seeking? Are we ready for this? This is why all of us should be, and some of us, all of us should be as a lifestyle in the education business. Some of us are professionally in the education business. We are wanting to raise up the next generation, the people around us, with answers, traditions, the, how to see the good, true, and the beautiful. So that when people do come asking, because I think they are, we have an answer for why we believe what we believe. And we can initiate, we can go, right now is the time to go and initiate, not apologetics kind of intellectual things only, but this kind of spirit, I'm going to treat you the way I would want to be treated. I honestly, I've said this before, I, I, just, I honestly think that in much of the evangelical world, we have traded saints for celebrities. In other words, we are, we are producing people who know things, who look good, we have stuff, we have technology, all of these things, but we are lacking, not all the way, but in large part, on character. People that are growing, people that are treating other people relationally the way God is treating them. He came for you. He didn't wait for us to figure it out. He initiated. He came at great risk to himself, and saved us. It is at the heart of redemption itself, or of salvation itself, the golden rule. What God, he came at great cost to himself and saved you, even though it potentially would not benefit. Think of it this way. If I knew that giving my son would save you all, if you knew that giving your child would save everybody in this room, would you do it? I don't think I would. I love you, but um, I'm still, I don't, I don't, I love my boy. But think about it this way. If I knew that giving my son would save a quarter of you, and the rest would know that I gave my son and would say, I don't care. I still want nothing to do with you. Would you give your kid in that situation? 
when it won't benefit you, when it won't even accomplish the goal, some people will know and reject God and reject Jesus and say, no, thank you. Would you do it then? Oh, the love of God. The love of God. Look at this. I didn't write it down, so I'm going to have to turn old school in a paper Bible. You've heard of, some of you have heard of this. This is what it looks like. Listen to this. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the children of God. This is the measure of love. Not that we love God, but he loved us. Felt warm and fluffy for us? Maybe. But mostly, he willed the good even when it got him killed. This is the stuff of love that can change the world. This is the stuff of love that's, that can change Seattle. I'm not kidding. And this is not theory. This is historical fact. This is the kind of love that turned the Greco-Roman world on its head in the ancient world. Christians living a cruciform life, that is, being on the offense, going out and loving at great cost to themselves, even though it was getting them killed. This is what can revive your marriage. Imagine our world if we all started practicing this way of life. I've heard some people say, Jesus is just trying to prove that we can't do it. No, I, you'll find none of that in the Sermon on the Mount. This is, this is, Jesus is trying to show us that we just need grace because we can't do it. Well, yes, we do need grace. That, I don't argue with that. But he's not trying to say that we can't do it. This is the ideal way to be human. This is what we were made for. We can lean into it, and we can learn it, and we can practice it, and he's going to show us how as we follow him. And imagine how our marriages would be. Imagine how our workplaces would be. How would your marriage be different if each person at all times, with everything we had from morning till night, treated the other person the way we wanted to be treated? How would marriage be for us? How would be parent different? Seriously, take a moment and imagine it. How would it be different? How would your team at work be different? How would the environment at, at your house be different? How many more friends would we have? Or maybe we'd have fewer, but the quality of those friendships would be awesome, would be amazing, would be deep. Think of, think of all the current disputes and un, uh, like arguments, un, unresolved tension with you and other people in your life. How could you apply the golden rule to those relationships and those arguments, those impasses? Some of us have said, well, I've tried and I'm done. How can you go back on the offense and make that call, write that letter, reach out, even though it may not, well, people say, well, I know what they'll say. Not the point. Even if it gets you killed, even if you get your hand slapped again, this is love. This is redemption. This is what it looks like. How would this potentially change society? You can just imagine if the golden rule was attempted and worked into and leaned into, it would ripple out to all the world. And again, not theory. It has done this. How? Jesus says, follow me. Follow me. Follow me to the cross. Live like me. Enjoy the Father like me. Be filled with joy like me. Sacrifice like me, knowing there will be a resurrection. You see? Today we're going to take communion. We do this every Sunday, but you can see how every part of the Bible applies to this. This is what saved you. What this represents, what these symbols represent, is what transferred your soul from a hell of a life to one that's on a track towards eternity with God, enjoying God now and heading that way. 
This is a reminder of that. And not just of what he's done for us, but how we also, as a template, as we as Christians, live. When you take this communion today, here's how we're going to do it. I want you to think of someone else. Don't think of it in an individualistic sense. Don't ignore the broken relationships in your life. Actually, face them. Bring them up and bring them to this. Is there someone that you're arguing with? Is there some broken relationship that seems like it's a dead end, irredeemable this side of heaven? Bring that burden with you to this and think through the power of these elements. This is how Jesus redeemed the world. Okay, we up for it? Okay, let's stand. Okay, be before God. Go back to acknowledging his presence. Acknowledge that he's been the one speaking. Hear his call. Follow me. And have, invite the Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, to bring up relationships that are stuck or maybe broken or, in your estimation, even ruined. Maybe think of your broken relationship with God, how you are beyond fixing, beyond saving yourself, And yet he did the unthinkable. At immense cost to himself, he came for you. He didn't just, well, I hope they figure it out. I've done my best. I tried. Oh, well, I hope they get it. No. He sent his son. This is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. That's to take on the penalty and the judgment that you and I deserve. Jesus was punished instead of you. Instead of me. He did the ultimate compromise. Think of how that translates to your relationships. To your marriage, to your kids, to your co-workers. Anthropoi to everyone. And the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread with his followers. He broke it, said, this is my body. Broken for you. I'm initiating this. Eat this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup and he blessed it and he said, this is, represents the the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. I'm doing this. I'm initiating this. Drink it in remembrance of me. When you're ready, take your time. You can come up and take communion. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise I could ever bring you worthy of every breath I will ever breathe I will live for you because you live for me Jesus the name above every other name 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, You're worthy of every breath I could ever breathe. I will live for you. Yeah, I will live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes. song I could ever sing. You're so worthy of all the praise I will ever bring. You're worthy of every breath I will ever breathe. I live for you. Jesus, the name above every name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. to pray for your enemies.
bring up specific people and faces in your mind and ask for God to bless them now, wherever they are. Take a moment. If you want to do this with someone next to you, your husband or your wife or maybe some friends that you have with you, spend some time thinking and praying for others. Go ahead, do it now. would you want if you were them? Just pray for them in that way. It is well. It is well.
Thank you for coming for me when it cost you so much. May that never cease to put me in awe and to fire my heart and my motivations to you. Lord, make us more and more into people of love as we follow you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for coming. Good work, everybody. Hey, we have lunch, I think. Yeah, we have lunch. So stick around. Let's talk together. Talk about how this applies to you. Be vulnerable with each other. What did this message mean for you? How are you processing this? And let's, let's talk about it. Mm -hmm.